Almighty. If you'll turn your Bibles with me to Revelations, the 19th chapter. We stopped at verse 10 last week, and I want to talk about Jesus is coming. In the 19th chapter of Revelations, verse 11 through 16, if you will, talks about Jesus coming again. Verse, uh, page 886 in my Bible, if that's helpful for you. Verse 11 of the 19th chapter, and I'll read down to verse 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he sat upon him with uh, was called faithful and true. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on, him, on his head were many crowns. And, he, and uh, he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. It says, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that uh, with, it, it, with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he traded the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. Verse 16. And he hath on his uh, vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the study of uh, Revelations as we've looked at the ending time. And Lord, you're coming again. You're coming again. And so we're talking tonight, Lord, about you coming again. And God, I pray that uh, you will uh, show us a couple of things and that we'll open our hearts to receive uh, and uh, receive what you desire for each of us to hear. And Lord, let us not be ignorant on the end times because time is coming. And Lord, we may be faced with it in this very lifetime. And so, Lord, I pray that we will be attentive to look and seek your will in all that we do. And, Lord, I pray your blessings upon us as we uh, continue to strive towards you here at Fearview Baptist Church. And, God, I just ask your blessings now. And we pray this in your precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our king is coming. There was a salesman who had uh, been working very hard in a particular city. He had a hotel room, and he would come in real late. I mean, very, very late at night. He was so tired. He sat on the edge of his bed and took his shoes off while he was on the edge of the bed uh, trying to come in. And the first shoe fell, and it went thump. And he thought to himself, he says, that's real rude of me to come in real late at night and allow my shoe to drop like that. There's somebody under me, living under me, so I don't want them to hear that and, and wake them up. He said, that was thoughtless of me. So it was late at night, so what, you know what he did? He took his other shoe off and he lightly put it on the floor. He got in the bed and went to sleep. In about 30 minutes, somebody knocked on the door. And it was the man underneath him. And he had, I mean, he had just gone to bed 30 minutes ago and he was at the door and he opened the door and there was the man that lived beneath him. And the man with dark circles under his eyes, he said to him, would you please drop the other shoe? The world is waiting for the other shoe to drop. And we should be waiting for the next shoe to drop because we need to realize that Christ was born in Bethlehem. We need to realize that Christ who walked the dusty roads of Galilee. We've got to remember uh, the Jesus, the Christ that hung naked on the cross. And he was buried and he rose again after three days and has ascended to the high heavens in glory. Folks, Jesus Christ is coming again. And I believe it with all my heart, mind, and soul. I believe this word of God would not uh, have so much ab about it. There's more about the end times than there is hell in the Bible. So I want you to realize the end time is coming, and I believe that Jesus is coming, and what a day that will be, a day of rejoicing that we're going to meet him face to face. And we're going to get to see him. And folks, we've got to realize that the stage that we're in right now is that uh, the incarnation without the coronation would be like the east missing the west. 
And so tonight, I want you to understand, it would be an engagement without a wedding, without a marriage. And, and we're waiting for the Lord Jesus to come. And friend, what a glorious time. It is to live between two mountain peaks, his incarnation and his coordination. The, uh, coordinating, uh, nation, I can't even suck, talk tonight. Boo, blah, blah, blah. We're on a collision course, is what I'm trying to say, with the destiny. And history is going to be written. Folks, history is being written right now. If you look at it, I don't know about you, but history is being written like we've never seen it before in your lifetime. And folks, we know uh, that uh, soon and very soon the king is coming. And we can't afford to be ignorant about the fact. We can't afford to be indifferent uh, as we wait for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why it's important that we get our friends and family saved and why we as a church need to be active and so winning and seeking God's will because the time is coming. We are in the pregnant stage of it. We're between two mountain peaks and he's coming again. And so today I pray that the hearts that are perplexed, the hearts that uh, sorrow that looks backward and the worry that looks around. But folks, I want you to realize faith looks up because he's coming. He's coming for you and I. And so he is the king. The king, Lord Jesus Christ, is coming. There's three things that I want to tell you. How is the king going to come? And it's very simple. It's listed in this passage and those uh, five uh, verses or six verses. Uh, it's listed there how he's coming again. Look at verse 1. I mean verse 1, verse 11. Uh, and it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. Now, my friends, do you believe that our God's faithful and true? I mean, I mean, he's going to come riding on a horse. We have no doubt who that is. We know that's Jesus Christ that he's talking about. But I want to tell you, when Jesus comes again, Jesus is coming visibly. Visibly. Well, what if I'm dead? You'll see him. Even the ones that crucified him are going to see when Jesus comes again. And you say, well, how do I know that? Well, Scripture tells me that. So here we, you know, people try to spiritualize the second coming of Jesus Christ, but it's the end of history. And perhaps the soul that dies and Jesus comes and carries it back to heaven. Folks, events happen. Things happen. And if somebody tells you that, that uh, the second coming's already happened, you tell them they're a lie. Because I want you to realize that we don't need to uh, get it frustrated or situated with another event that's taking place. And indeed, we need to go meet the Lord, and we will when we die. But the apostle there on Mount, uh, Mount Tr Trigger Trigger the Transfiguration uh, is coming. Uh, heard the angel say in Acts 1 verse 11. Listen to what he, the angel said. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you up into heaven shall uh, uh, so come like manner as, as ye have seen him go into heaven. So he's going to come back the way he left. He's going to ascend in heaven. He's going to come busting through the clouds. And, and we go, why? My friends, we've got to realize he went away literally, actually, bodily, and visibly. He's coming back literally, actually, bodily, and visibly. The Apostle John in verse 11 says, I saw the heaven opened and behold a white horse. This horse is going to come riding out of the clouds. And my friends, we've got to realize that. And it says the man that was riding on that was faithful and true. And John said, this is what I saw. And maybe we're sitting here tonight and we're saying, well, John saw this. I didn't see it. Perhaps I won't see this. Well, I want you to realize you're fooling yourself. You will see it. Revelations, the first chapter, verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Now, even those, my, my, now my friends, there's different cults and different religions out there that are telling people that, uh, about different events in history, saying that's the second coming of Jesus. He has not come. He is coming. And we need to prepare our hearts for his coming. I don't want him to catch us doing something we should not be do. Uh, and my friends, if somebody tells you that another event was the second coming, you've got to tell them you don't believe it. Because Jesus is coming again. You will see it. You will visibly see him when he comes. Because it says, every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, it says in Scripture. 
And that means all the people of all times for 2,000 years that's been in existence will see when Jesus comes again. You say, well, how how are they going to see it if they're in the grave? Well, my friends, my God's good. He can raise the grave. My friends, all kindred of the earth shall bewild him, it says. And actually in Revelation 22, 20, it says, Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Folks, I don't know about you, but I'm ready for him to come. Aren't you ready for him to come again? Am I the only person here? Are y'all waiting? Jesus is coming back visibly with power, great glory, and majesty. And we need to be excited about that. Just like we need to get excited when somebody accepts Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Well, Brother Jeff, that wasn't my grandchild. They don't care. It was a child of God. We need to rejoice. The question is, is he coming secretly or is he coming like a thief in the night? Because he's coming in what we just read here in majesty, power, and glory. The answer to that question is yes and yes. He is coming quietly like a thief in the night. And he's coming with majesty and power and with glory. And my friends, he deserves our glory. He's given us what we've got. And today you didn't earn it. It came from the power and the presence of the God upon which we live. Now we must understand this or we're going to be hopelessly confused. And there are people hopelessly confused. Now listen to what I'm fixing to tell you. This is what you've got to understand or you're going to be hopelessly confused. Because people have got it wrong and people misunderstand about his second coming. Folks, there are two aspects about the coming Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, what is it? Well, it's very simple. The first one is the rapture. The second time he comes again, my friends, is going to be a revelation. It's going to be a revelation. When Jesus comes, with, uh, uh, when he comes again, it's a revelation. The rapture is when Christ comes for the bride, and that's you and I. The bride is the church. You and I are the ones that are married to the Father in heaven. And my friends, Jesus died so that we can be married. We are the bride. He loves the church. He loves you. And, and the revelation is when Jesus comes with his bride. See, the first time he's going to come and he's going to pick us up and he's going to say, let's go. And then after he picks us up, we're going to come back with him and he's coming with his bride to fight the nations. He's going to come with a sword in his mouth. He's not coming uh, to fight an actual battle. He's going to say a few words and they're going to die. That's the God we serve. That's the strength of the mighty God that we serve that's coming again. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 11, he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together with him. So we're going to just gather to Christ in the rapture. And he's going to take us home to be with him. And we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. Now, my friends, I've really worried about this because I'm scared of heights. I'm a fat man scared of heights. Because, I, you know what, I, I want you to realize, I don't float, I sink. And so I'm really worried about my eyes being open and seeing this. But you know, I've got to remember that my God even takes care of our emotions. He said, we're going to be emotionless. We're not going to feel emotions that we feel on earth. Praise God that we're not going to feel like the emotions. We're not going to go there depressed. We're not going to go up there with frustration. We're going to go and be with him whole. And look him at his, in his face. So first of all, Jesus is coming for his church. And and then in verse 14 of the 19th chapter that we just read, it says this. And the armies which were in heaven followed him uh, unto the white horses, clothed in fine linen and white uh, white and clean. So now who are these armies? Which the saints and the bride. That's you and I. That's the saints of yesterdays, and and that's the bride, you and I, the church, the one that he died for, the one that he started, the one that he loves, the one that he desires for you to get saved if you're not saved. But we have just read about the bride being dressed in his wedding dress. White linen, that represents the righteousness of the saints. The righteousness of the saints. So he's coming both in a mystery, and he's coming in majesty. He's coming for the rapture for the bride. you got to understand this. And then he's coming with a revelation. And the revelation with his bride. 
He's going to come and defend his name. He's going to stand up and he's going to take this earth back. It belongs to him and it's going to be his. And it's going to be his at the end time. It's going to be his at all times. And we need to realize that. What you have today will fade and die. The only thing you have that will last for eternity is everlasting life. An everlasting life, and I've never figured it out, and I've said it multiple times to you, I've said it multiple times everywhere I've ever been, is that everlasting starts the moment you get saved. Now, if we are living in the everlasting, boy, well, it, it could be a lot more fun. It couldn't be a lot more fun. The problem is we don't allow it to be more fun. The problem is, is that we don't think heavenly, we think earthly. We've got to think heavenly, and every day our prayer should be, God, let me think like you think. Let me see as you see. Let me do as you do, not as I do, because I'm living on this earth for him. Each of us are, have a mission. Each of us are serving him and not ourselves, and that's the problem is putting that self-effort to the side and saying, Christ, I live for you. And, folks, we are to here to live for Christ. And you see, people have lost the focus of that. But when I thought about him coming again and I thought about this approach that he's going to come he's going to come visibly I, I thought about what else visibly are we going to see well Jesus is going to come suddenly like lightning the Bible says it Jesus is, is coming is described like a boat out of the blue a flash of lightning you say, how do I know that? Well, Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 27 says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming the, coming the Son of Man be. That's Matthew 24, 27. That's right there in that New Testament. And he says, hey, this is what's going to happen. It's going to come like a bolt of lightning. It's going to be suddenly. We're not going to have time to change anything. We're not going to have, you see, but that's the anticipation. We as Christians need to be anticipating his return. And when we're anticipating his return, we need to make sure that we are prepared. We might, that's why every night we should repent. Every day we should read our scripture. Say, Lord, I, I, listen, when he comes back, I want to be called good and faithful servant. Come home. You see, but we don't know the hour and the time. Is there something in your life, is there something in your home that you'd be ashamed of if Jesus caught you doing it? He's coming. We don't know the hour or the time. So we've got to be on ready all the time. Well, how can you do that, preacher? I'll be a nervous wreck. Well, my friends, I, it's called living a Christian life. It's thinking heavenly, not earthly. And that's the problem. we got to be spiritual. And the only way you can be spiritual, if you read your scripture and understand what the book says, Jesus is coming like a sudden, like lightning. But then Jesus is coming secretly like a thief. Lightning, but he's coming secretly like a, a thief. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, it says, For ourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord uh, so cometh as in the thief in the night. So look at the flashing of lightning that everybody can see it. Do you notice that? Everybody can see the lightning, but then it's like a thief who comes quietly. So what does that tell me? That God has everything covered. He's going to sneak up on folks. Matter of fact, Roland got, came in here. I thought he came by me. He didn't come by me. He just slipped in, and I didn't see him when he came in uh, and, and whatnot, but he just came right past me. He says, yeah, I'll sneak in on you. Well, that's what Christ may do, and that's why we've got to be ready because he may come like a thief. He's going to come like that lightning, but he may come like that thief in the night just like that. But then I also think about visibly. Not only is he a thief, not only is lightning, but Jesus is coming sweetly like a bridegroom. Like a bridegroom. He's coming for his bride. And my friends, I want to tell you the anticipation is great. And he's excited about coming for his bride because, my friends, he's been working for years for you now years in our time but maybe two days in his time but he's been working preparing for your coming and i don't want him to be disappointed it says in matthew 25 6 jesus is coming sweetly like a bridegroom it says at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him and so there's going to be a herald that says the bridegroom's coming get ready but then not only Lightning, not only a thief, not only like a bridegroom. But the fourth thing I thought about is we were thinking about Jesus visibly. I thought about Jesus is coming sovereignly as a king. 
He's coming as a king. He's finally going to be the king that the Jews thought that he was supposed to be when he came and died on the cross. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7 and 8 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord uh, Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with a mighty angels in a flaming fire. Take vengeance on them that know not God. And that day, uh, and that day, uh, and, and, and that uh, obey not the gospel and uh, the people that do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ is what it says. And that's first, uh, Second Thessalonians 7, 8. So Jesus is coming. Well, is that not exciting? Well, some people, it's not a big deal. It's just a thing that's going to happen. But my friends, it is a big deal. It's a big party. It's the biggest party you've ever been to. It's going to be bigger than game day on, on college football. I mean, it's going to be bigger than the stadiums that you've ever been in and seeing 80 to 90,000 people roaring in the stands. My friends, it's going to be, it's going to be a party that you've never even uh, felt like. And you think, you'll think, why did I think Jesus was a cosmic killjoy all the time? I've got to sit uh, rigid and, and fidget. Folks, I want to tell you something. There's going to be some juking and shouting and cutting up going on in heaven. And that's where we're going to be in Baptist. We're going to be stuck in a room to learn how to do that stuff. But that's what he's doing is, is visibly, he's coming for you and I. And that's what we're seeing here. Jesus is coming back visibly. Everybody's going to see him. Everybody's going to know it. Everybody from all time is going to know that Jesus is coming. And they're going to see it. I'm excited about that day. Are you excited about that day? I'm excited about that day. So the first thing that I find in this passage is that he is coming visibly. We can see it. The second thing is that I will tell you is that Jesus is coming victoriously. Victoriously. And uh, if you will look again at verse 12 and 13. And it says, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And uh, he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed. And a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. So. Not only is he coming visibly. But now I see Jesus coming victoriously. We sing the song victory in Jesus. Do we not? Is there victory in Jesus? You better believe there is. And he's, gonna, he's coming back victori victoriously. Now this one that John uh, beholds this white horse coming visibly. Who is coming victoriously. So all this is a picture of victory. And I want you to look at the picture that's drawn to us, starting with verse 11. Starting in verse 11, he says, and I'll read it again. And I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. So he's riding a white horse. When he entered into Jerusalem the first time. Do you remember how Jesus entered Jerusalem the first time? When they threw those palms at him and, and uh, bowed down to him and said, Hail him, hail him. And a few days later they were saying, Nail him. And they crucified to him a cross. Do you know what he was riding? A donkey. A lowly donkey. But the second time he goes to Jerusalem. He won't be riding on no lowly donkey. No, my friends, he's going to be riding on a white charger. He's going to be riding on a white charger. The white horse was a symbol of victory, honor, and conquest. So the mastery of this conquest is that he has mastered it, that he's coming back. He's going to win the war, and we know he's going to win the war. There's no doubt, and they know it too. I don't know why they put up this big defense knowing that they're not going to overcome him. But the mastery of this victory is his conquest, and he's coming back again. My friends, he has a way, and I'm, you know, if you ever can figure out what Jesus did and why he did it, then you're better than anybody else on the planet earth. Because, my friends, he's going to come back with, in a, on a horse in white, meaning victory. And, and that's the mastery of the conquest. He has mastered it. He said, it's not my day, it's their day. Do you remember that? When he was on the cross, he said, it's not my day, it's their day. He says, my day's coming. Well, his day's coming at the end of history. 
where he's going to declare victory and mastery of the conquest and he's going to rule over them and they're all going to be his minions and they're all going to follow him and we're all going to follow him. It says in Romans, the 14th chapter, verse 11, uh, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. You know, and that's what, what gets me. Why do we want to wait until he comes again? Why can't we do it now? Why do we wait? So the mastery of the conquest, he's got it conquered. But then verse 12 tells me even something different about uh, this victory. It says, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. So not only is it the mastery of the conquest, it's the mystery of his character. Now, he is righteous and true. He's faithful. That's what it says that's riding on the back of the, uh, of the white horse. He makes war, righteous war, it says. His eyes are like, uh, uh, like the flame of fire. But the import of this is that he has a name that no one knows. Now, the Bible says that God hath, in Philippians 2, 9, says, give him a name which is above every name. What's his name? Jesus I don't know, I've never figured out, you know, why Christians are so ashamed of Jesus. The Bible says if we're ashamed of Jesus, he's going to be ashamed of us before our Father and his angels, did he not? Why are we ashamed to wave the banner of Christianity? Why are we ashamed? See, that's what's happened is that Christians have forgotten that we have victory in Jesus. And that victory is real. He's mastered the conquest. But the mystery of his character, my friends, there is a mystery about him you will never fathom and never know, even in heaven. He is the highest of the high. And we just think that he's just another guy. He's far above us. One of these days, listen to me. Now, this makes me want to, if I had the energy, I'd run down the aisles and slap some folks in the head. I mean, really. I really would. If I had the strength tonight. One of the days, listen, one of these days, if you're a believer, you're going to be like him. I'm going to be like him? What? I mean, does that not get you excited? You're going to be like Jesus. You're going to know everything that's going on on this petty world. And my friends, Isaiah 14, 14 says, I'm going to be like the Most High. Man, that makes me want to shout. That makes me want to just, just tell people, do you not realize what you're sacrificing? If you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to be like him one day if you believe in him. And you're going to, you're going to rule with him. You're going to sit hand in hand with him. And we're going to be one with him because we are and have Christ inside of us. This is what he tried to tell Eve in Genesis, the third chapter, verse 5. He said, you'll be as God. He tried to tell Eve and Adam that, but they didn't get it. He is higher than the high. Can you imagine? And one day I'm going to be like that. That just excites me. Does that not excite us? It should excite us. And maybe it's not, you know, maybe I, I, I'm Pentecostal in that thought. But, but anyway, I'm excited about that. That means there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more hurt, there'll be no more frustration, there'll be no more emotions. It'll be perfect like he first made it. You know, and I know it's hard to believe, but when he created this earth uh, uh, in Genesis, I mean, uh, do you know it was made perfect until Adam and Eve sinned, right? Do you know being naked was normal? I can't even imagine that today. We have perverted that so bad. Has the world not done that? I mean, I mean, you would have looked at each other as perfect. But sin had to come into the world, and, and that's why he had to send his Jesus. Matter of fact, they lost the domain, and it had to be won back. And it had to be won back by our God, and he had to win it back so that we can serve him and so that we can, he can have dominion again in our hearts and lives. So there's the mastery of the conquest, then there's the mystery of his character. There are things that we're never going to know. And I want you to realize that People think, well, if I just knew why. Folks, there are things you'll never know why. And if you just got to know why, you're never going to know why. You just have to accept that Christ knows what he's doing. Do we believe that our Christ is able? Do we believe that he mastered it? Do we believe that, that he is the, his myster, uh, mysterious uh, uh, character? I mean, do you, can you just imagine? Why would he have us do this? Why would he have us do that? 
Why would he give us the responsibility to share Jesus? We're the only ones sharing Jesus. Do you know that? When we're a bag of holes, are we not? We're a bag full of holes, and he chooses us, sinners, to share the gospel message. Now, if we don't share the gospel message, then people in this world will not know Jesus. And it'll be our fault. You see, that blows me, my mind away. See, but I'm not Jesus. You know, I, I, I want to I wanna see Jesus. When I see him and I'm supposed to be like him, I'll be face to face. I want to know, did you have to clean your room when you were in Nazareth? And, and how did it work out for that guy that hung on the cross beside you that was a thief? You said, today you'll be with me in paradise. God, do you mean that he went right then? Sure he did. And people say, well, I don't believe in deathbed uh, uh, salvation, folks. I believe in deathbed salvation. You call upon the name of the Jesus and you mean it truly in your heart, you're saved. You see, the majesty of his character and of his, uh, of his conquest, but the mystery of his character is just unreal. Well, I mean, we'll never wrap our brain around it. You know, salvation was not our idea. I told you that this morning. It was Christ's. But then the third thing in verse 12 that I see is the majesty of his, of his coronation. The majesty of his coronation. You see it in verse 12? It says he has on his head, what? Many crowns. Many crowns. A victor's crown. The regal crown that a king would wear when he's won the battle. He has many, not just one. He is the king of kings and lord of lords, he says. No longer does he wear the crown made by the briars of this world. He wears what? The jewels of heaven. And I'm going to love to see my Savior wear those crowns. And, I, and listen, y'all better be practicing. Uh, Vonda, we need to sing it because we better practice it. We're going to sing crown him with many crowns. Because we're going to sing it because he's crowned with many crowns when he comes back. And, and that's the majesty of his coordination. He's the leader. He's finally going to become the king. And maybe the Jews will finally follow him. But my friends, I want you to realize that, that he's going to have those crowns of what he's done for you and I. Folks, he is worthy of all the crowns. And he is worthy of everything we can give him. And it, gives, it breaks my heart when we half-heartedly worship and we half-heartedly go and half-heartedly listen and half-heartedly do what Christ has asked us to do. The blessings that we miss because we forget that not only was he visibly, but he came. Jesus, when he came, was victorious. So not only his character, not only his coronation, but the ministry of his crucifixion. It says it there in verse 13. It's called a vesture dipped in the blood. That's what it says. You remember Calvary, right? And of that precious blood. The Lord Jesus Christ wears forever an emblem of the sacrifice that took place in Calvary. Thank God for the ministry of the crucifixion. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ that gives us victory. It's his blood, not ours. What is the hope for this world? Is there hope? Yes, there's hope. Folks, science is not the answer. Science has made this world a neighborhood, not a brotherhood. The great Vance Habner used to say, and I loved what he used to say. Listen to what he said. Civil civilization is like a chimpanzee with a, a blowtorch in a room full of dynamite. One of the greatest preachers of all times said civilization is like a, a chimpanzee with a blowtorch in a room full of dynamite. Folks, that's the situation that we're in. That's the world that we live in. And, and that world wants to dampen our spirits and not remind us that Christ is coming again and get us to understand that we don't need this, my friends. Politics are not the answer. It's not going to deliver us. We win wars. We lose the peace. Now these days we can't even win a war. Social reform is not the answer. All social reform does, if it prevails at all, is to make the world a better place to go to hell from. That's all it does. Listen, it's not going to save this world. Now, I'm not from... Uh, in the business. I am not in the business, and we should not be in the business uh, of rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. 
We're supposed to be winning folks to Jesus. You see, that's the ministry of the crucifixion, that he died and bled. I'm waiting for the Lord Jesus to come again. The answer to this world's problem, believe me without a shadow of a doubt, that it is the coming Lord Jesus Christ. He is the answer. He will solve our world's problem. He will fix any problems we've got in this world. And it'll be all over when he says, it's done. And people go, how can I have victory in Jesus? Well, you've got to let Jesus live in you. And when Jesus lives in you, he's going to direct you. He's going to encourage you. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to give you what you need to make it through this whole world. He says, listen, I may not fix your problem. I, you know, Jesus didn't die to, for us to, uh, for, to fix our troubles. He came to get in trouble with us. He came to get in trouble with us. He says, but I'll make a way for you to escape. I'll make it where you can bear it. He says, I know what you can handle. He says, I know you're made of dirt. Isn't that what he says in Psalms? And I'm thankful that I serve a God that knows me in and out, the good and the bad. You know, the bad that only your wife knows about you. So he's coming visibly. But the second thing I tell you, he's coming victoriously. That's what it reads. That's what it says, that he's going to be victorious. And my friends, I am glad I'm on the winning side. If not, you're with the loser. And we don't want to be losers. Nobody wants to be with losers. By any means... But no, Jesus is coming visibly, victoriously. But verse 14 through 16 says this. It says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, uh, that with it he shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he says, He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, my friends, this one is one that most people don't want to talk about, but I've got to talk about it because it says it. Uh, Jesus is coming vengefully. People don't like to talk about vengeance. They don't like the idea of judgment. Now, I want you to understand, I think a lot of people think God's un-American because he's going to judge sin. Folks, we've allowed sin to run too long on our streets. There are people who say, well, you know, God is too good to punish sin. Well, Paul wrote in 12th chapter, verse 19 of Romans, he said, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, saith the Lord. He said, saith the Lord. Paul was just repeating what... Christ had already said, or God had already said to him, and he said, that's what, verse 15 says, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. My friends, if you're saved, you're winning, but if you're on the other side, you're in the losing side. Vengeful. God's going to come back with vengeance, and he's going to judge this world. All those things that people thought they'd get away with. Oh, those hard-headed people when you knocked on the door and they wouldn't let you in and said, I don't want to talk about that God stuff. Those people that walk out the door and slam it in your face. Those people at work that didn't want to hear it. Or those people at, your, at, at, at the grocery store. My friends, he, they're going to have vengeance. God's going to have vengeance on them. That's what it reads and that's what it says. And I feel sorry for those that have not received him. But there's a few things I'll tell you in closing. One is this. We're to learn of his coming. We're to learn about him. We need to learn that he's coming again. You can't afford to be ignorant on those things. You must teach others these things. Our youth and children need to hear this. Because it's happening. It's going to happen. The world needs to learn. Jesus said over and over and over and over and over and over and over. You know what he said? Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. I'm going to come like a thief in the night. Be ready. I'm going to come like lightning. Be ready. The question in my heart it always is, God, am I ready? Am I ready for you to come today? Oh, I've got some other things I want to do. We've got to be ready. There's no, there's no backing up. When he comes, we've got to be ready. 
There's no time to, to ponder around and say, I need to go win somebody. Listen, what happened to the rich ruler that went down there and wanted to build big barns out of all the money that he made? And he wanted, oh God, just let me go back and tell my brothers about it. He says, oh no, son, it's over. We've got to make that decision here on earth. Not when we get to hell or when we get to heaven. We've got to make that decision now. And so we've got to realize we are to learn of his coming. My friends, and, and, and I would tell you tonight that we need to tell everybody that he's coming again. But also, with a general thought, we are to look for his coming. Now, I want you to realize something very quickly. Is we are not waiting on some prophecy to be fulfilled. We're not. We're not waiting on a prophecy to be fulfilled. I would be waiting for something to happen. I'd be waiting for something to happen. We are to live every day as Jesus was to come, looking for his coming. Looking. You see, and, and that's the word as most churches, and not just, I'm not talking about Fairview, just the general church of Jesus Christ, is that the word anticipation. And I've also found this true in most churches today, uh, when I used to do revivals, is that expectancy has gone. We don't expect anything at church. We just come. My friends, I still serve a miracle working God. My God can still change people's lives. He can still change me. He can still mold me and make me. And folks, we need to be looking for his coming. We need to realize that he's coming back. And we need to be living every day like it's our last one. But then I need to tell you, not only do I need to learn and look, but I need to realize that we are to long for his coming. We're supposed to long for it. The last prayer in the Bible. I just said it to you. Revelation 22 verse 20. It says even so come Lord Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus. What a day that will be when I see Jesus longing for his coming. The reason I'm still a pastor. Is because I'm longing for Jesus. And I want others to be ready for him coming. I want them to long for it. Do you know if we're longing and living every day like it's our last one, life would be a little bit different? Don't you think our lives would be a little bit different if we knew that he's coming back at 8 o'clock tonight on our way home from church? Wouldn't our life look a little different? Wouldn't we do some things different? Wouldn't we clean up some things and, and, and get some things out of the way and make sure that God doesn't see those things? But we need to be longing for it every day of our lives. We need to prepare our hearts and minds and be ready for it. But the last thing I tell you, we are to live for his coming. Last of all, we need to live for his coming. The Bible says in Luke, the 19th chapter, verse 13, he says, Occupy till I come. Occupy until I come. But while I occupy until he comes, I want to be found serving him. Now, service has become a word that we don't use anymore in churches because it's offensive. That means that you're asking somebody to do something for Jesus. And my friends, if you're not doing something for Jesus, then you may not be a Jesus follower. Because how in the world could you have Jesus in your heart and not witness about him? There's no possible way. I want him to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. We're to live for his coming. We need to occupy till he comes, but we don't need to sit on our hands and, 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 and fingers. We need to be standing up and saying, God, I'm going to serve you to the day is in. Because, listen, we only have a short time and a window. And you say, well, Brother Jeff, I've heard it for years. Yes, we've heard it for years. But he may come just tomorrow and prove to you that he meant he was coming like a thief in the night. You can't chance that because the Bible says it. Everybody that preached it before me and will preach it in the days to come is right. It may be any moment, any second, any time. And the question is, am I ready? He said, be ready. Am I ready? And the question tonight, when we think about this, about him's coming again, and it's going to be an exciting time, or am I ready? Spiritually, am I ready? Do I know everything that I possibly can to make a difference in somebody's life? You see, that's why we do all the things we do on Sundays. That's why we do the things on Wednesday nights. That's why we go to camp. That's why we go on mission trips is to win people to Jesus. And if the purpose of a church is not to win people to Jesus, then you're a glorified country club with a steeple on top. Because that's the purpose of a church, last time I checked. 
is to win the lost. And that's what we need to become as Christians is a hub of spirituality. But how do we do that? It's reading scripture and trying to figure out what it really means. And using the real gospel, not the substitute. And so Jesus said, here. And John wrote, he's coming. Well, he's coming. But the question is, are believers ready? Am I ready? Is there something I need to do different than I did the week before? I can't make you go and I can't make you change. I can't make you do anything. My job is to be a tool to be used. And your job is to be a tool to be used by Jesus. To let him work through you and in you and for you. See, he died on the cross so he could give himself to us. What are we doing with that Jesus? Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you for the mission. I thank you for the mission of understanding of what you're coming again. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be, be a day of shouting, a day of celebration. And Lord, I can't wait to meet you face to face. There's so many things I want to ask you, but Lord, I know that when that, time, that moment comes, I won't remember us, one of them. And that's okay. You will unveil the things that need to be unveiled. And I need to be patient and longing, waiting for you, learning about your coming, learning that I need to be looking and ready. And the question is, is every heart here tonight ready? If you're not, he says, I want to talk with you. I want to work with you. I want to encourage you, he says, through Scripture. He wants you to feel the fullness of Christ. You see, in... So very often, Christians don't have the fullness of Christ. And we can have it. It's for the taking. And it's okay to admit, I don't have everything I need, Lord, but help me to be that vessel, to learn. Lord, we're sinners and we fall short. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. We're all sinners here. But Lord, I'm thankful by the blood of Jesus, you'll wash us white as snow. I'm thankful that you're coming again and you have said time and time and we've ignored and we've ignored. And Lord, our world has ignored that you're coming. Lord, I don't know the day or time and would never tell anybody I know the day and time. But I do know this. I'm supposed to be ready. And the question is tonight, Lord, are we ready for what is to come? And we can't wait to the last moment. We've got to be ready now. Lord, help us to be ready for what you desire. We are yours and you alone. Do what you desire with us. Wherever you lead, we'll go. Wherever you send us, we'll do it. Whatever you ask us to do, even though it may sound like something we've never done before, we're going to do it because we love you. Thank you for loving us. When we were yet sinners, you died. And Lord, I'm thankful that you executed us with you. And Lord, I pray that today that you'll continue to bless us as we leave this place, as we go to our work and schools tomorrow, as we go about our everyday tasks. Will I ask myself tomorrow at school, am I ready? Will I ask myself at work, am I ready? You see, Lord, you're asking us every day, but we're not listening. And so, Lord, I pray that you open our hearts to that understanding that you're a mighty God. And, Lord, I just thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that as we come to the closing of this book that we can say that we've learned something. And, Lord, I thank you for speaking to me and changing me and seeing those things that you have written and how it can affect us if we allow it. Bless you and direct us now in the time of invitation. And thank you for being our God. We're unworthy. We pray this in your precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen.